You know, there's a reason why I'm dressed up like this. Um, this, if, if I can just be completely honest, growing up, this is what I thought heaven was going to be like. Um, growing up, the, the idea of heaven for me had a lot more to do with uh, Philadelphia cream cheese commercials. <laughs> Uh, touched by an angel, <laughs> uh, or different books that I read, right? I, I was being informed more from that stuff than I was from anything else. And if I can be completely honest, um, heaven seemed really boring. Like, like, like just, just me being honest, not where I stand today, but like growing up as a kid, when I thought about heaven, I, I, I was a little bit discouraged by it. I mean, the one cool thing was in my head, I thought that we had wings and who doesn't want to fly. But like outside of that, every other piece of it just seemed a little bit weird to me. Uh, and, and apparently we get to wear bathrobes. We somewhat change species and look like angels. That was, that was my viewpoint growing up. And and, and then there, there, there was one part that, that kind of really threw me, and that was that we would apparently be singing nonstop for all of eternity. And, and now listen, I, I like singing as much as the next guy, but, but you know what it is? You know the song Amazing Grace? Great song. I love the song Amazing Grace, but there's that one line in there that when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And again, I like singing, but 10,000 years. Honestly, in my mind, I'm just like, I, I don't know if I want this heaven, right? Like, like it was after 30, 40 minutes, I'm good. I, I don't need to sing anymore, right? Like, but but in, in growing up, the, the honest truth is I felt guilty. Um, I, I felt uh, like there was something wrong with me. Why was everybody else really interested in heaven? And yet I, I was almost put off by, by certain images. And, and, and what I've grown to learn is this, that really there, there wasn't anything wrong with me. Now that's debatable, okay? But what was more wrong was my theology. What was wrong was that, again, I was taking my cues not from Scripture, but I was taking them from all these other sources, and it really messed with my head at a young age. Now, here's the good news today. You ready? We're going to read Scripture. Okay? We're going to, yeah, yeah, somebody can clap for that. <laughs> today, what we're going to do uh, is we are, I need to take this off. <laughs> uh, today, what we're going to do is um, in, in order to uh, learn today, in order to grow in all the right ways, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try to wipe your imaginations clean for the moment. Uh, what I want you to do is uh, I want you to erase everything you think you know about heaven. Uh, forget the Philadelphia cream cheese commercials. It is delicious, but horrible theology. Forget touched by an angel. Forget me dressed up here uh, in this costume. Forget all of that. Uh, today, we are a blank canvas. And it's our goal in our time together here to let God, by his word and by his spirit, speak to us right here and now to reveal his truths about heaven. You ready to go? Okay, now that I have my costume off, we can talk. I have one goal today, and that is to try to answer the question, what is heaven? Now, what makes answering this question difficult is that we, uh, 2,000 years later, uh, have a different understanding of heaven than the Hebrew people did thousands of years ago when the Bible was actually being written. Uh, for us, the, the, the majority of us, uh, when we think about heaven, we think about some place that we go to when we die. Uh, and although that was an aspect 
uh, somewhat of an aspect of, of the Hebrew belief of heaven that was only a slight aspect of it. In fact, the Hebrews had three different understandings of the word heaven and how they used the word heaven. Uh, the first way that they used the word heaven was to talk about the universe. Literally, the universe and every single thing in it, the stars, the planets. Uh, how about the very first verse of the Bible? What does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, in the earth, right? The, the, the Hebrews would use heaven to talk about the cosmos. They would also use the word heaven to talk about uh, God invading earth. So there'd be these moments where, where just supernatural stuff would happen. There was this invasion of God's presence. And a great example is Genesis 28. Jacob has this vision of, of heaven and earth and angels coming down and, and back. And, and when, he, when he comes out of that vision, he says, this is Bethel, or this is the house of God. And he says, this right here on earth, this is the gateway to heaven. Wherever God is intervening, that is heaven. So they, was, heaven is the cosmos. Heaven is also the infiltration of God into our world. And then third was this, that they believed that heaven was the age to come. Now, seeing as this is a series on the afterlife, today, as much as I would love to do a sermon on the cosmos and God invading earth, today, my comments are going to be related to heaven in the age to come. What does that mean? What is it? What, what's going to be happening? So we're going to we're going to look at a bunch of scripture today, and hopefully in our time together, we can see what heaven is, and we can also see what heaven is not. Are you with me this morning? Okay. All right. I have four points. I've been told sermons, a good sermon is three. I broke the rule. I have... Four points, but if you're taking notes, this would be a good message. You can just write this down. We're going to start very practical. Ready? Here it is. Point number one. Heaven is a real place. Selah. I'm just going to let that sit. Heaven is an actual real place, just like Windsor is a real place. Just like Guatemala is a real place, just like Africa is a real place, heaven is a real place place. Uh, turn with me. If you've got a Bible, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11 first. Uh, Hebrews 11, phenomenal chapter in the Bible. It really stands out unique. We, we call it the great faith chapter, and it's just filled with all these stories of men and women and, and all their, their great steps of faith. And I just want to read you verse 16. It says this, but they, so who's that again? The great men and women of faith, we're looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared, I love this, a city for them. Okay, uh, this right here, the, the scriptures use all sorts of different metaphors to describe heaven. Sometimes heaven is referenced as a party. Sometimes heaven is referenced as a country. Sometimes heaven is referenced as a, a, a garden, a home. There's all these different images. Here, it's, it's called a city. And so someone's going to ask the question, okay, pastor, so which one is it? Is heaven a city? Is it a kingdom? Is it a party? Is it a garden? Or is it a home? Ready for my answer? Yes. It's called metaphor. It's called metaphor. And uh, metaphor, last week when I was talking about hell, uh, I said that wherever the scripture uses metaphor, it simply means that it cannot be described. So in hell's case, it's much worse, but in heaven's case, it's much better. Yeah. But, but what we get in the scriptures are metaphors. We get images, glimpses at something that is, to be honest, really, really, really hard to describe. I mean, think about John. I, honestly, just a, a good like, challenge for you this week. Go home, 
read the book of Revelation and, and count how many times John uses the word like. Just count them. He just goes through. Well, well, the, 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 the throne was like this. The colors were like this. The one who was seated on the throne was, was like this. Like, 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 like. He's, he's stretching and striving to try to explain the inexplainable. Right? He doesn't have the vocabulary to actually describe heaven. But just because heaven is hard to describe does not mean that it's not real. This is my first point. Heaven is a real place. You with me so far? Okay, here's my second point. Heaven right now is veiled. It's veiled. Like nobody's going to just stumble upon it. Um, I I love this. On September 5th, 1977, NASA launched the Voyager 1 spacecraft. This spacecraft travels at 62,140 kilometers an hour. Okay, you get that? That's fast. 62,140 kilometers an hour. And it has been traveling at that speed since September 5th, 1977. And guess what? The Voyager 1 spacecraft is never going to find heaven. It's not just going to bump into the pearly gates all of a sudden. That's, it's, it's, it's not how it works. See, what we need to understand is that heaven is veiled. There is a chasm between heaven and earth that is more than just sky and space. L- look with me at Revelation chapter 4. Uh, John here is getting access into heaven. And it says this, 4 verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door. Say door. There was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. John gets access into heaven, but he only gets access through a door that God provided. Do you see that? It, John wasn't just stumbling about, and he's like, oh, man, there's heaven. No. John didn't find heaven. God found John and gave John access into heaven. That's very different. God provided a doorway in. There, there, there has to be on this side of eternity um, for any human being to get any access or image or glimpse of heaven, the only way that that works is by God to give access there. Why? Because right now, it's veiled. Heaven is a real place, but right now, it is also a veiled place, which tees me up perfect for my third point, okay? Here's my third point. I I, I hope that this makes you feel warm inside. Point number three, Heaven one day will be unveiled and come to earth. This is good news. Heaven, I'm going to say it. Heaven one day will be unveiled and will come to earth. Now, um, for us Christians, if we're going to go off in our theology, this is probably the point. Because even though we can laugh about me dressed up here with some fake wings and a bathrobe, the reality is that there's probably several listening to me right now that your viewpoint is that somewhere upon death, you're going to, you're going to leave, you're going to go up to heaven and then you're going to stay there. Right? And like, In fact, this is such the dominant viewpoint that if you Google image heaven, What are you going to see? Clouds, golden gates, everything's up in the sky, and apparently that's where we spend eternity. The only problem with that is going to be the Bible. Okay? Uh, The Bible actually teaches something very different, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so what I want to do is I want to read for you from the Old Testament and from the New Testament, and we can see uh, some of the imagery here. 
Uh, let's go to Job chapter 19. If you're new to the Bible, you might think this is the book of Job, but it's actually Job. Job is the oldest writing that we have in the Bible. It's the oldest. Uh, the, the, the book of Job was written thousands of years ago. And here in Job, we actually see out of our scriptures the oldest writing of somebody speaking about death in the afterlife. And I want you to listen very carefully to what Job says. Job 19, we'll pick it up in verse 25. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Come on, somebody say amen. <laughs> That's just good right there. And he says, and that in the end, he's saying, when it's all said and done, in the end, he, who's the he? God, the Redeemer, Lord, enter Jesus in there. Okay? He will stand on the, what's the word? Earth. Earth. I, and I love as he goes on, listen to this. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Oh, this is so good. Job, thousands of years ago, gives us insight into the afterlife in heaven. And he says, in the end, when my skin is destroyed, okay, he's saying when I'm dead. Interesting what he says right next. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. So he's saying two very seemingly contradictory things, right? He's saying, well, well what, what's happening? He's saying, no, I'm going to die and then I'm going to resurrect. And he says, and on that day, when I resurrect in new flesh, he said, I'm going to see God face to face. Okay, this is important. Where? On earth. In the end, heaven comes to earth. I'll give you another passage, uh, Philippians 3.20. Uh, this is a favorite for us in the church, but it says this, but our citizenship, Paul says this to the church in Philippi, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Oh, I just have good scripture today. I just pray you're encouraged, honestly. Last week, can we just, okay, last week was rough, okay? We, I need to hear some amens from our church, okay? Like Paul says, man, there's a day coming where, when we're gonna get new, resurrected, glorified bodies just like Jesus. But see what he said here. Notice that Paul doesn't say our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await to go there. It's not what he said. He said, our citizenship is in heaven and we're eagerly awaiting a savior from there. You see the difference? Heaven is coming to earth. So let's recap really quick. Heaven is a real place. Real. Right now, heaven is veiled. In order to get any experience of heaven, it, you must be given access by God. And then point number three is this, that heaven one day will be unveiled for all eyes to see. Nothing will be hidden anymore, and heaven will come to earth. Which leads me into my fourth point. And I'll take maybe a little bit more time here. And here it is. Heaven is the absence of everything bad in the presence of everything good. We live today with so much pain around us all the time. This is one of the few points that I can stand up here and I don't have to work hard to convince you of. Right? Like, how many people agree we live with pain? Okay? We just do. And it's from the smallest things like a, a, a cold uh, into cancer. It's uh, from abuse into racism. 
We, we deal with hatred and violence, lust and lies. It's some, I mean, it's just around us, right? It's kind of like the air that we breathe on this side of eternity. It's broken. Genesis chapter one and two, everything was good. God made it good. Creation was good. Humanity was good. And then sin enters the picture and fractures everything. Everything is fractured. Every single thing is fractured, right? It's, it's broken. It's, we live in this world where sin is present around us all the time. And because of that, it can be difficult to even try to imagine a reality where this were not so. Like, it can be difficult to, to actually grow up, and we hear about heaven at a young age, and as we grow up and we really see the world for what it is today, it, 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 can, it can almost be hard, right, for us to actually believe that there is a place where there's none of that stuff. But this is the case with heaven. Heaven is the absence of everything evil and wrong and broken in simultaneously the presence of everything good and right and true. And there's no text, in my opinion, that better shows this than Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, you got a Bible, f f flip over there. Um, almost, if you're new to the Bible, it's basically go to the end. Uh, Revelation 21. This is the final picture. Okay, this is not a present reality, but this is what is coming for the church. For those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that as we read this, remember I said in the beginning, we just need to like wipe our imaginations clean. We're a, we're a blank canvas in this moment. Uh, I pray that as I read the truths of scripture here of what is coming that you will begin to start in a new way to picture what heaven is. Let's read Revelation 21, starting in verse one. John says, then I saw a new heaven in a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then listen to this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Beautiful passage. Worship team, come on up. We're going to worship in a moment. The final picture is not us going up. The final picture is the bride of Christ, the church coming down to be united with Jesus, our groom, as he makes everything new. Come on, let me hear you say the word new. <laughs> new. In the Greek language, in the Greek language, there's two different words for new. This is very important this morning. There's two different words. Uh, and I'm saying Greek because that's what we have revelation written in. Neos and kainos. Neos means new in origin, something just completely new. Then there's kainos, which is new in quality, something that, that, that's maybe broken, but but it's gonna get fixed. Something that along the line is gonna get refurbished and made better. Here, John very carefully says, he who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything kainos. I'm making everything new in quality. So the, the, the picture, think about a blacksmith. A blacksmith who 
takes an iron and he puts it in the fire. Not to destroy the iron. It's not to destroy the metal, but what he does is he puts it in the fire so that when it comes out, he can make it into something strong and beautiful. That's the picture here. At some point in history, God is going to take all of his creation, all of it, the world, the stars, the cosmos, us, humanity, and he's gonna put us through a fire. But it's not a destructive fire, it's a refining fire where somehow everything comes out on the backside better. Listen to me, God's goal was never to eradicate his creation. His goal was to fix it. He says, I am making everything new. In heaven, there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more disease, no more COVID, no more cancer, no more depression, no more anxiety, no more sleepless nights, no more violence, no more abuse, no more racism, no more sex trafficking. No more waking up at three in the morning in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And somebody said, amen. The younger part of our church is like, what? I don't, I don't understand. Heaven is the absence of everything bad. And it is simultaneously the presence of everything good. And what I mean by that is that heaven is the unrestricted, untethered, unchained presence of God himself. Do you understand what I'm saying? John says in Revelation 21, he, uses, he says, look, Everybody pay attention because, because what I'm seeing is so crazy. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. The other day I'm driving with my son, Bo. We're going to go pick up Nora and um, I'm trying to teach him about Jesus. And at a very young age, you know, we, we tell our kids, and it's a true statement, right? Like, where does God live? Well, God lives in my heart. Well, my three-year-old son has a hard time understanding that. Um, he just does. And so we're driving, and he starts asking me questions, like, G uh, like, like Daddy, does, does Jesus have bones? And I'm trying to figure out, like, sure, buddy, what are, what are you getting at? <laughs> and because and, he's, he's trying to make sense how... How is there another human being living inside of me? And, and then he made this statement. I actually wrote it down. We were just driving. There was a moment of silence. And all of a sudden he said, Daddy, I wish Jesus would come out of my heart because I love him. And it's an interesting point, right? He's three years old. He's trying to make sense of this. But he's acknowledging the reality that he can't see Jesus. So if Jesus is on the inside of him, what does he want? He wants him on the outside so we can give him a hug. We talk all day long in our house about Jesus and what he's done for us and what he's doing and what he's gonna continue to do. And my son just wants to give him a hug. Hear me. There is a future coming when my son will not have to say that. There is a future coming when, my, when we're not gonna have to wrestle with this with this. Uh, reality of God is spirit alone is the one that, that we kind of experience but like there's going to be this reality in the future where God in the flesh Jesus resurrected Jesus in the flesh <laughs> will be this close like, like this you got to understand church at some point 
Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he's bringing heaven with him. There's going to be a great cosmic collision where heaven and earth are going to collide and become one shared space and we will spend eternity in new resurrected bodies that never break down on a new resurrected earth that never breaks apart and all the while in the very presence of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings himself. And on that day, And on that day, we'll be home. But never make the mistake that we're home right now. Our citizenship is not here now. Our citizenship is in heaven on earth in the future. This this is our great hope, honestly. Like this is our great hope as Christians, what I'm telling you right now, because we're not there yet. We know this is not our home. We feel it in our bodies. We we experience it in our workplaces. There's something wrong right now. And we breathe that in all the time. And so there is this moment of, of hope. Like right now, man, like the reality is in this room, We have sick people. We have people who are just laid off, people who can't get pregnant. We have people who who, who just are, are just, they're like in a cloud of depression and anxiety. Something's wrong here. Stand on up to your feet. I, I, I wanna read you a Bible verse, but before we worship, Listen to what Paul teaches the church. And I pray as we close this whole series on the afterlife, I pray that this passage is just what we walk out of here with. He says, therefore, do not lose heart. What's he addressing? We're not home. Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. I love, okay, first of all, he's saying, yeah, don't lose heart. We have trials, legitimate trials. They're difficult. Our bodies are breaking down. He says, don't lose heart because when that's happening, what what you don't see is the unseen reality that God is renewing us the very essence of who we are day by day. And then he goes on to say this, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What Paul is saying is there is an eternal glory coming when heaven meets earth in the presence of Jesus that is going to somehow make every struggle on this side of eternity seem small. Man, we're in this moment right now and it seems big. It seems big, it seems overwhelming, and yet this is true, that there is an eternal glory that is so much bigger and better and stronger than we can ever understand. And then I love this, he says, so we, church, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says, church, keep your eyes, not on what is temporary, but on what is eternal. Why? Because we know how the story ends. You with me? We know how the story ends. In the end, Jesus reigns victorious. In the end, we receive new bodies. In the end, man, new heaven, new earth, same space. In the end, we get to spend eternity with God. So he says, keep your eyes fixed, not on what is seen. Get your eyes off of this world and get them onto the unseen realities. There is a God accomplishing a big 
plan right now with your life and others people's lives. Man, there is a future reality for anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. Man, the, the reality is this, okay? You're gonna die. Unless Jesus comes back, you're going to die. Upon that moment, upon that moment, there, we will face judgment before God. There's no hiding that reality. But what you choose in this moment determines the rest of your eternity. We can say, no, we don't want this God. And that is a scary reality that God will give you what you want. He will give you what you want. If you want separation from him, he will give it to you. Oh, but there's a truth here that for those who want God now, you get God then. You understand? We say yes to Jesus, man, and we get heaven on earth. Church, our God is so glorious. We've got metaphors and images. What makes hell, hell is not fire and flames. It's the absence of the presence of Jesus. What makes heaven, heaven is not mansions and gold streets. It's the presence of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the factor of what makes hell, hell and heaven, heaven. Parkwood, I just want Jesus.